I'm so honored to be here, and thanks for this warm reception. And I want to thank Dr. Corey and Dr. Moeller, and especially, I've got to thank the theology department here at Biola University. This is so cool. We are so excited at Johnny and Friends, because with the help of Dr. Langner and Dr. Cunningham, and especially Dr. Kathy McReynolds, uh, there will be an integration seminar in the Bible department starting spring of 2008, and it's going to be on the theology of suffering and disability. My hands don't work. I can't applaud your theology department for that, but this course will mean that so many more disabled people like me will be reached with the good news of Jesus, because I tell you what, statistics are skyrocketing, disability is on the rise, what do you do with those kids with autism in Sunday school who keep screaming and jumping up? And what do you do with elderly people who have Alzheimer's? How are churches going to be prepared? Well, I am proud to announce that Biola University is the first in the country to have a course in the Bible department on reaching people like me, families like mine, in this Theology of Suffering and Disability course being offered in spring 2008. Guys, the first in the country. Applaud your department for that. Yes. That's wonderful. And Dr. Kathy McReynolds and Dr. Cunningham and Dr. Langner are working with our team at Johnny and Friends at the International Disability Center. If ever you want to take a hike up to the San Fernando Valley, just go west on the 101, come visit us at the International Disability Center. And when you do, you'll meet our team at the Christian Institute on Disability. We're on the front lines and we are battling a lot of the bioethic questions as uh, there is advancements in stem cell research. Of course, we love that, but we wanna make certain it's the right kind of stem cell research, not destroying human embryos to get their stem cells, but using adult tissues. Other questions related to tough, sticky ethical issues, and we want to arm Christians with the answers. And so I want the team from the Johnny and Friends International Disability Center, including uh, Steve Bundy, who's the managing director, to stand up because these are the guys on the front lines of that debate. Would you friends please stand and welcome them? Yeah! Thank you for letting me borrow your hands. Mine don't work so well, thank you. That course will cover a lot of practical issues. Um, what do you say to people like me? Are we handy capable, handy culpable? Are we physically challenged? Are we physically impaired? Motion impaired, motionly challenged, or just special? <laughs> what are we? Well, we'll help you understand who we are and what we, what we can do with our abilities in our disability. But one of the toughest questions that I want to speak to you today, and I'm not going to skate on the surface. This is no smoke and mirrors up here. This is not your, you know, thin on the ice testimony. Because I think some of the toughest questions you gotta wrestle with are the ones I wrestled with when I was your age, when I had broken my neck in that diving accident. You saw the images. I was your age. All my best memories of what it felt like to be on my feet are frozen in your time. And I have some tough questions about the goodness of God. How in the world, God, can you be so good? How can you say oh, you are merciful and compassionate? And here, when I was in high school, right before I graduated, oh God, I had prayed that I might have a closer walk with you. So this is your idea of an answer to prayer? Man, you're never gonna be trusted in another one of my prayers again. <laughs> she, is this how you treat your new believers? Quadriplegia, unable to walk, can't use my hands. You can identify, I mean, you are at the age that I was at when I had crunched my neck. I used to lie in that hospital bed, wrenching my head back and forth on the pillow at night after visiting hours were over, hoping to break my neck at some higher level to end my life that way. You can identify, and you don't even have to be a quadriplegic. 
Who is this God? It's the kind of question that we'll be tackling in that Theology of Suffering and Disability class. I mean, does God say, into each life a little rain must fall, and then does he aim a hose in Earth's general direction to see who gets the wettest? <laughs> That's what I thought. That's what I thought. I thought my diving accident was a fluke of fate, a flip of the coin, and if God had anything to do with it at all, I figured that when I had been poised on that raft, ready to take that dive, I figured at that point, God must have been off somewhere listening to the prayers of more obedient saints, you know, Christians he really liked. I felt like he didn't like me because, although I had been a Christian in high school, Jesus really wasn't preeminent in my life. My boyfriend was on a Friday night. And so I was struggling with rebellion. And I had figured that maybe God really was listening to the prayers of saints that he liked better. Or maybe he was fulfilling people's prayer requests about cancer. Or maybe he was off in the Middle East somewhere fulfilling prophecy. Or you know, I, I didn't know where he was, but he certainly wasn't there at that raft when I took that dive. And perhaps since his back was turned, I figured that it was then Satan who snuck up behind me and put his foot in the small of my back and gave a hard shove and off I go into the water, breaking my neck, lying face down. And I figured that around about that point, God turned around. He saw me facing, uh, floating face down in the water and he kind of went, oh man, what you going to do that for? <laughs> And then I figured he had to quick go off and run and get his mop and bucket and spick and span and hammer and nails and glue gun and then go running after my life, trying to fix it back together for my good and his glory. I figured that God had been caught off guard when my diving accident had happened, that somehow there was some kind of monkey wrench that had been thrown into his plans for my life. A view like that shows God as helpless and as held hostage by my handicap as I was. But that's what I thought. And I tell you, frankly, it really scared me. It scared me. I mean, God had to be bigger than that. Now, I had enough sense to know that the Bible probably contained answers for my problems, my pain, my paralysis, my situation. I figured the Bible probably contained answers. I just had nowhere to look. I mean, those are big questions. If God is good, why all this suffering? After I got out of the hospital, a young man knocked on the back door of my house. He was a sophomore at the high school that I had graduated from two years before. And he had heard that his neighbor, me, Johnny, had really some tough questions about the Lord. He had heard that I, a senior, was struggling. And so his name was Steve Vestas. He said that he'd be happy to help me walk through the Bible, tackle some of those tough questions. As long as I provided lots of pizza and RC colas, he would be there every Thursday night. And I'll never forget that first Thursday night over pizza and RC colas. The first question I asked him was, okay, how can, uh, how can this, how can this be God's will? It's a good question. It was a good question 40 years ago when I sat at that table with my friend, and it's a good question now. Perhaps some of you are wrestling with that question, and you don't have a broken neck, but maybe you're struggling with a broken heart or a broken home. Well, welcome to the Theology of Suffering and Disability, Spring Semester 101, right? I'm not gonna skate on the surface, as I told you first on. I'm not gonna be platitudinous up here my answers won't be trite. This is not smoke and mirrors. 
My questions back then were get down, get dirty, and gut-wrenching. I mean, think of the time suffering has ripped into your sanity, leaving your emotions numb and bleeding and raw. Was that God's will? Well, that was my question. Steve paused a minute and he leaned back in his chair and he closed his Bible at that point. And with the most serious look, he peered straight into my eyes and he said, Johnny, it's a good question. And I can't pretend to have all the answers. But I know that first we've got to start with Jesus. You know Jesus? Yes, I know Jesus. Come on. Why else would I have invited you here with a Bible? I could tell he was a sophomore. <laughs> Steve then took a deep breath and he said to me, well, Johnny, Jesus was the most God-forsaken man who ever lived. And if we can find answers for his life and his suffering, then I think they will suffice for you and suffice for me. So he said, let me turn your question around. Was it God's will that Jesus Christ go to the cross? <laughs> I could really tell he was a sophomore now. Of course it was God's will. I mean, come on, it's all about salvation. It's all about confessing your sin. It's all about uh, when we are weak, he is strong. Sure, salvation comes from the cross. Yes, it was God's will. Steve paused a minute and said, well, if you think so, let's just consider some of those awful things that happened. Because no doubt it was Satan who whispered in the ear of Judas Iscariot, prodding that traitor on to hand over Jesus for a mere 30 pieces of silver. And you better believe that it was the devil who no doubt prodded Pontius Pilate to hand down mock justice in order to gain political popularity. And you better believe that it was Satan who instigated that bloodthirsty mob in the streets of Jerusalem screaming, crucify him, crucify him. And then he said, let me flip to Matthew chapter 27 real fast. Listen to this, he said. After Jesus was flogged, the governor's soldiers took him into the praetorium and gathered around him a whole company of soldiers. Man, I, I don't even want to think about what happened at that point. Scripture doesn't cover it. Oh, they say they beat him and they stripped him and they mocked him and they spit on him, but a whole company of soldiers, men, most of them probably drunk, a little bloodthirsty themselves. I cannot even begin to imagine it would be an X-rated movie come out of Hollywood to describe what they did to Jesus at that point. I'm sure those soldiers showed him absolutely no mercy. And then he was pushed up that hill to be crucified. My friend Steve Estes looked at me and said, how can any of that be God's will? Think of what those soldiers did to him in the Praetorium. How can that be God's will? Betrayal, treason, injustice, murder, torture, torture with a capital T. How could a loving God permit this? How could the father allow such awful things to happen to his son? I tell you what, I was dead quiet right then. I didn't have an answer. I mean, you know, we sing song it through Sunday school that Jesus went to the cross, and yes, that's God's will, and sure, we all have our salvation. But having rehearsed the details of what those people did and how it involved betrayal and torture and injustice and murder and treason, all the worst things that are happening around the world right now, I had no response. But Steve did. He flipped open to the New Testament a little further from Matthew, and he read out of Acts chapter 4, verse 28. Listen to this, he said, Johnny. These men did. That's the soldiers, drunken. That's the mob in the streets. That's Pontius Pilate. That's Judas Iscariot. These men did what God's power and will had decided beforehand should happen. 
God wanted it to happen. And the world's worst murder becomes the world's only salvation. The devil slit his own throat when he inspired the crucifixion. Oh, don't worry. It was the idea of people who were there in the streets of the Jerusalem. I'm sure that God did not make those people, Judas Iscariot, Pontius Pilate, do those things. No, that sin was already in their heart. They already had the idea in their head. God just let out the leash a little. God permits all sorts of things he does not approve of. Do you hear that? God permits all sorts of awful things to happen that he does not approve of. Now, take the crucifixion. I mean, perhaps the devil's motive in inspiring the cross was um, to put an end to this ridiculous talk about redemption. No more talk from the Son of Man. Shut him up. Impale him on a cross. But God's motive was to abort that devilish scheme. God's motive was to, through that crucifixion, throw open the floodgates of heaven so that whosoever will might come in. Johnny, my friend, said, God permits what he hates to accomplish things that he loves. Now I'm going to tell you something. After Steve left that night, and I had a lot of time to think about that lying in bed, what strange, wonderful comfort the thought brought to me. God wrote the book on suffering, and he called it Jesus. Dr. Peter Kreeft once wrote that when it comes to suffering, God does not try to get himself off the hook. Never, no. Jesus Christ is God on the hook. And God reached down into the worst kind of evil and he kind of wrenched out of it positive good for us and those who would but believe and glory for himself. In other words, he redeemed it. Jesus Christ, the only one in any religion, you can search him for yourself, because I did, flipping through the pages of, of um, Siddhartha and uh, what else, Viktor Frankl and psycho I mean, I was everywhere, flipping with the mouse stick through these books back and forth when I was first injured, desperately to find the answers. And I tell you what, only the Bible had them. Only the Bible had them. Because only in the Bible did I see any evidence of God, Christ, redeeming suffering. The God of life conquered death by embracing it. And death no longer has the victory. Hallelujah. And you know what? Neither does suffering. Christ has given it meaning. Christ has given it purpose. And it's all for our salvation and our sanctification. I mean, when you became a Christian, when you were 14 years old, 12 years old, it wasn't like you walked up to a counter and slapped your sins on the counter in the exchange for the price of somebody else's blood, and then you walk away with, a, with an asbestos-lined soul. And, you know, you get on with living. Thank you, God. I'll check in with you every now and then. But um, I've got this Christian thing pretty much figured out now. I've read through the New Testament. I got the epistles, insights, and directives. I, I pretty much know how to handle this thing. No, no, no. It's not that simple. Suffering is there not only at the point of your salvation, but suffering will walk with you like a strange, dark companion during your process of sanctification. But I tell you what, even that speaks to me in this wheelchair so powerfully and so poignantly. I am no longer alone in the midst of my quadriplegia, my disability is not a flip of the coin. It is not a fluke of fate. It is not some cosmic accident. I mean, when I dove off that raft, I did not fall from divine plan A to divine plan R. No. It can be redeemed 
it was redeemed and it is still being redeemed. Oh, I tell you what, the wonder of it all. And of all the scriptures that speak most powerfully to this point about God redeeming your suffering and mine, not just for our salvation, but our sanctification. <laughs> the most powerful scripture of them all was one that I had read underlined in my high school Bible. It was one of those subsequent Thursday nights with my friend Steve Estes. This guy was smart. By the way, he's got eight kids now, married, and pastors a church in Elberson, Pennsylvania that's on this huge building program. People want to hear. They want to hear the tough answers to the hard questions. So on one of those subsequent Thursday nights, Steve took my own high school Bible, because I had showed him where I'd underlined this verse when he mentioned it, and there it was. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. You know it well. You may have it memorized. It could be your life verse. It was mine when I came to Christ as a 14-year-old at a Young Life camp. I'll read it for you. The Apostle Paul, who incidentally went through his own disability, says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, sharing in the fellowship of his suffering and becoming like him in his death. Well, I looked at that verse and I wasn't quite sure how it fit into this whole idea about God redeeming suffering. But then Steve walked me through it. He said, Johnny, you want to know Christ, right? Duh. Of course I want to know Christ. Yeah, I want to know him. And the power of his resurrection? <laughs> you bet, bring it on. I'm ready for it. How about the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings? Well, I'm not so sure that I want to know Jesus that badly. I mean, after all, I am in a wheelchair. But then again, my soul does need a good scrubbing every now and then, and uh, trials do shape our character and refine our faith, so uh, I guess the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> okay, so I wouldn't be in the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. Steve could already see that I was coming at it from my own agenda. He said to me, Johnny, God wants more than that, much more than that. He wants you to come to the cross. Well, I already went to the cross when I was 14 at that Young Life Weekend retreat. He said, no, no, now, remember, it's not just your salvation, it's your sanctification. He wants you to come to the cross now. And as I began think about it, thinking about it, I realized, you know, if I've got to be honest with myself, nobody really wants to go there. <laughs> nobody is naturally inclined to go to the cross. Our flesh doesn't want to go there. It doesn't want to get mortified. You read about that, right, in the King James? Remember that? Mortify your flesh. Hello? No way. <laughs> My flesh kind of likes this uh, earthly life with all its sensual pleasures. Thank you, no. We are not naturally drawn our human instincts do not lead us to the cross even after we become a believer in Jesus Christ. God knows that about us. He has no illusions about us. He, 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 he knows us well. And so God bless his little heart, big heart, excuse me, <laughs> is going to force you there. He will hands down slam dunk force you there whether you want to go there or not, he will permit that broken heart or that broken home or my broken neck. And I tell you what, then suffering in your life and mine becomes a, a, a sheepdog, snapping at your heels, barking at your heels, driving you to the cross. It becomes that jackhammer, breaking apart your rocks of resistance. Suffering becomes that, what do you know, chisel, chipping away at your pride. Until I tell you what, you become so bent and broken and down for the count, decimated, driven to Calvary by the overwhelming conviction, oh God, I, I haven't got any place else to go. I have nowhere else to go. The Lord does not despise a broken heart and a contrite spirit. 
And so he will allow that suffering in your life to force you to the cross by the overwhelming conviction that you don't have any place else to go. And I tell you, when you're at the cross, that's where you quit, let go of sin. Oh my goodness, let go of the, the what can I let go of here? Okay, bitterness, uh, resentment, uh, worry, fear about the future, doubts, unbelief, anxieties. And that's what it means to become like him in his death. That's what God is after, friends. He wants you to become like him in his death. He wants you to daily take up your cross and die to the sins that Jesus died for on his cross. That's what it means to become like him in his death. We don't want to let go of our sins. We like the sins, we like the pleasures. But it's always suffering like a sheepdog that snaps on our heels. And when we are driven up against the cross, and 2 Corinthians tells us, the cross is the power of God. Oh, then we're so quick to release that sin. Let it go, let it go, get it out of my life. I can't stand this heartache. I wanna let it go. And at the cross, that's what it means to not only become as like as death, but that's how suffering is redeemed. That's how the death of Christ on his cross gives meaning to your suffering. Because when you become like him in his death, hallelujah, then you can have his life. God only shares his joy on his terms. And those terms call for us to, in some measure, suffer as his dear son suffered when he walked here on earth. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 tells us that, to this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. I mean, maybe, maybe when I had my diving accident, the devil's motive in my life was to shipwreck my faith, have me become embittered, make me as a young Christian get angry at God so I could defame his reputation and smear his good name. Maybe that's what the devil's motive was. But remember, God reaches down into what otherwise looks like awful evil and he wrenches out of it positive good for us and glory for himself. And I do believe that God aborted that devilish scheme. And God, his motive in my diving accident was to turn a headstrong, stubborn, rebellious teenage kid who was fooling around with her boyfriend far too intimately on Friday nights, who was a little rebellious against her parents, who by now maybe had been through her third divorce, I don't know, abortions, who knows what would have happened, but I would not be sitting here in a wheelchair telling you how much I love Jesus. And so I know God's motive was to change me and make me more like him. That's the sanctification part, and it's not done. I mean, 40 years later, you want to know how I'm still waking up in the morning? Honestly, the alarm clock goes off, my husband's off to work. I hear my girlfriend come in the front door. I could hear her running water in the kitchen for coffee. And I know she's going to come into my bedroom in a few minutes with a hot cup of coffee and a happy smile and hello. And she's going to give me a bed bath. She's going to range of motion exercise my legs. She's going to transfer me out of my wheelchair, get me dressed into my uh, chair, push me into the bathroom, brush my hair, blow my nose, brush my teeth, and then shove me out the front door after breakfast. I, and I'm already thinking, lying there with my head on the pillow, oh God, can I go back to sleep? Uh, I am so tired of quadriplegia. I cannot believe I gotta go through this routine again. I am so sick of this routine. Lord Jesus, I don't have the energy or the strength to make it to lunch. How am I gonna get there? Oh God, I have no resources, but you do. I have no strength, I can't do this thing called quadriplegia, God, but I can do all things through you who strengthen me. Lord God, I have no smile for this girl who's gonna walk into my bedroom in a minute with this cup of coffee and start my morning routine, I have no smile, but you do. Oh God, let me borrow your smile, please let me borrow your smile. I have no smile for this day, but you do show up big time. And I'm gonna tell you what, before 7.30 in the morning, I already have joy hard fought for from heaven. And like hope springs eternal, my praise and thanksgiving to God because I have become like him in his death. You know what I mean? Chosen not to complain and be sour 
and have a rotten attitude for the day because I think, you know, hey, who else has to go through what I go through? I mean, you know, I'm a quadriplegic. Come on, God, give me some time off from obeying you. Don't I deserve a little bit of self-pity here? You put it to death. And when you become like Jesus in his death, you daily take up that cross, die to that sin, and guess what? You experience joy. You experience peace. You experience power. You experience a perspective on life that is sent straight from heaven, and it's wonderful. God is ecstasy beyond description, and it is worth anything, anything to be his friend, even quadriplegia. Of course, the day will come in heaven when I get my due glorified body and I cannot wait. I'm going to take my wheelchair to heaven. You won't hear about that in the theology department. It is wrong theology. It's erroneous. I will not be able to take. No, no, no. Can't take the wheelchair to heaven. But if I could, I, I might. And I'd put it right over there. Right, right there. And then I would come back over here. I'd be standing up with my new Slim, wonderful, glorified body. <laughs> oh, ooh, I'm going to look so good. I'm going to jump up, dance, kick, do aerobics. It's going to be such fun. And I'm going to be standing here right next to Jesus. I'm going to say, Jesus, you see that thing over there, that wheelchair? You were right when you said, in this world you will have trouble. Oh, God, that thing was so much trouble. But Jesus, the weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. Oh God, I just don't know that I would have realized how strong you are and how sufficient your grace is were it not for that thing. So praise you. It was a gift. All that stuff you said about suffering with you, you leaving me an example that I should follow in your steps for my salvation and my sanctification, you were right. Praise your name. And the wattage on God's glory is just going to go up so bright and beautiful. And then I'm going to say, now you can set it to hell if you want to. <laughs> yes! God is going to close the curtain on sin and suffering and all that sickling stuff. He's going to vindicate his good name. He's going to set things right in this new world order. And I will say in heaven that I can look back in the rearview mirror and I will say, thank God for that wheelchair. It woke me up out of my spiritual slumber. It, 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 it wrenched the world's suction cups off my heart. It got me seriously thinking about the lordship of Christ in my life. It helped me convince the skeptical, unbelieving world that God's grace really does sustain. It showcased that there is a real heaven and a real hell to contend with and that there are more important things in life than walking. Men and women, there are millions of people suffering around the world, most of them people with disabilities. They need to hear this perspective on God. There are mothers, single mothers, who are bruised and broken because their husbands have left them since they gave birth to a young child with cerebral palsy. They need to hear this perspective on God. Our churches aren't prepared. So many of our churches, and I won't name denominations, just don't know what to do with people who have cerebral palsy, who break their necks. All they want to do is get them healed. Oh, God wants you out of that wheelchair. <laughs> Hello, there's more to affliction than that kind of surface perspective. I mean, when people come up to me and say, you know what, you need to be healed out of that wheelchair, I say, you know what's really important to me? Why don't you ask that God heal me of my stubborn self-centeredness? That would be really good. Would you, would you please pray for that? I mean, that's the things God's interested in. Not that he isn't focused and not that he isn't concerned about my quadriplegia, but he's concerned so much with what's on the inside. Friends, people need to hear this perspective in the disability community. And that's why I praise God. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for what vision Biola University has to institute and implement this spring 2008 course of study. Hallelujah. Most of all, in closing, this wheelchair has shown me that Jesus Christ, oh, he's the answer. God is not quick to give us answers when we demand them from him, but he is quick to give us the answer, Jesus. 
He's not quick to give us a bunch of words, a lot of advice <laughs> when we hurt and come to him bruised and bleeding, but he is quick to give us the word, the word made flesh. And I tell you what, guys and girls, <laughs> you don't have to break your neck to believe it. God bless you and thank you for listening.